Hello everyone, I am your professor of communication. I am Ms. Shalel Billionis and in this video I'll be discussing with you our week one topics and coverage. So for those who are having a hard time digesting the module, this video is definitely for you. So let me start off by sharing with you our week one topics. All right, so for week one we will be talking about the processes of communication, the principles of communication, both in oral and in written, and of course, we have the ethics in communication. Okay, now, first off, we're going to talk about language. What is language? Technically, it is defined as a system of rules or grammar. It's, it has included itself with phonology and, of course, vocabulary. Now, the question is, do animals have language? The answer is no. They don't have language in the strictest sense. They don't have language, but they are communicating with each other. Okay, they can communicate. They are not producing the language that we are having, same as the language that we are having. Okay, so let's continue. Moving on, we have terminologies associated with um, learning and communication. We have speech community. Okay, they are people sharing the same set of rules in the language system. So, for example, if we're living here in Negros Occidental, we have the same spe speech community because we are all speaking Hilingainon. If you go to America, they belong in the same speech community because they are speaking in English, of course. And we have language acquisition. It's the process of acquiring language used by those in the community. Okay, while we are growing, unconsciously we are learning the language from our parents, from our relatives, from our friends, from our playmates. So that process is called language acquisition. Now, what about mother tongue? It's the first language that you acquire while growing up. So for us, our mother tongue would not be English, but Hiligaynon, of course, because that's our dialect. And it is also referred to as first language. Okay, and the last part is what we call as language learning. So that's the language learned by studying formally in school or informally on their own. Okay, I guess that's self-explanatory. So English, we are learning English. That's why it falls under the category of language learning. If you are learning Japanese or Chinese or, or Koreans, for example, that's language learning. Now, you might ask me, what about English? Is it, does it fall under language learning or language acquisition? Well, it depends. There are families wherein English has been a part of their language at home. So children, while growing up, acquire English, aside from its mother tongue, by talking to their parents in English. And at the same time, when they go to school, they also learn it. So that falls under language learning as well. So the answer to that question is both. It really depends. So just a, a key thing, right, that you need to bear in mind. When we say language acquisition, you acquire language sometimes unconsciously just by talking to grown-ups, especially for, for children. But when we say language learning, it's a kind of language that you really need to go to the school in order to learn it. Sometimes by watching videos, okay, Th that's language learning. Now let's move on to our next part. And that's going to be, what is communication? Well, it is defined as the exchange of thoughts, ideas, concepts, and views between among two or more people, various contexts come into play. So as I mentioned earlier, animals have communication. And people, people we also have communication. We, in terms of communication, we have different 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 types of communication and uh, the first one is in terms of context we say context it's the situation environment in which the communication takes place so it includes the physical or actual setting the value positions of a speaker or listener okay like what he or she believes in and the relevance or appropriateness of a message is conveyed okay so that's context let's move on we have 
in terms, okay, look at the picture. You can see here that there are two people talking. And of course, in the middle part, there's that guy who's listening to the conversation of the two people. Now, we talk about communication, it has a cl classification, right? So the classification of communication is in terms of mode, in terms of context, and in terms of purpose and style. We'll get to know more about it as we go along in this video. Okay, so types of communication according to mode. The first one is, of course, right, as you can see, this guy is probably applying for a position and uh, fortunately he was accepted he was very happy right and moving on that's an example actually of verbal or nonverbal communication nonverbal communication in a sense that as you can see they are shaking their hands shaking their hands is an example of nonverbal communication using signs and gestures your facial expression fall under nonverbal communication your eye contact Okay, but for verbal communication, it's the use of words, okay, to communicate your ideas, your thoughts, your feelings. Another uh, type of communication according to mode is what you can see in there, the picture, right? The guy is looking at the picture and then, or the wall, probably that's a mural. And out of that mural, there is communication there because... It's as, if, it's as if that the artist is communicating to the person who is viewing that, um, that art, okay? So that's what we call as a visual communication. And we often do that, right? That's why they said that picture paints a thousand words. Sometimes just by viewing a simple picture, we can have a lot of messages in it. We can communicate through pictures. Okay, so that's what we call as visual communication. Now, this time, there is also types of communication according to context. Okay, so we have here, the first one is intrapersonal. When we say intrapersonal, it's happening from within, meaning you're communicating within yourself. That's what we call as reflection. We always do that, of course. Say, for example, when we are uh, reflecting on our day's scenario, like what we did in today's activity, right? We reflect. We say, "Did I do? Did I do good today? Did I make something bad?" Right. So you are asking yourself. That's intrapersonal. Okay. Not when we talk about that, you might be thinking, "Oh, come on, maybe." You, about, am I crazy if I do that? Well, of course not. According to research, actually, that's what you call as metacognitive or metacognition. You are trying to think more about yourself, okay? You are trying to reflect. And according to research, it's actually a highest form of intelligence. You are able to reflect on what you've done wrong, what you've done right, something like that. Okay, next we have, okay, so yeah, that's what you can see in the picture. And then we have interpersonal communication from the prefix inter, meaning it's with other people. So communication with other people, not that kind of communication, of course, okay, but the highlight to that is they are having teamwork, but not in a good sense of course, something that we should not do, okay? And here you, they are communicating through friends and they are playing over here, okay? That's interpersonal communication. Kids communicate, yeah, especially when they're playing, they're, communicate, they're communicating a lot. Okay, next we have two objectives of interpersonal communication. We have transactional and maintaining social relationship. When you say transactional, you are trying, you're communicating because you wanted to get some information from someone. Okay, but when you say maintaining social relationship, you're communicating because we want to build relationship with each other. You want to strengthen your relationship. That's why there's there's a great role of communication in there. So those are the two objectives of our interpersonal communication. Now in here, I'll be giving you situations and then think about your answers to this question. In the situation number one, we have speaker A, speaker B, right? They're talking. So 
If we, you're going to read that, Speaker A said, Hello, I'm Kay Ramos, and you? Oh, I'm Venice Mendoza. Glad to meet you. How are you related to the bride? She's my cousin. Her mom and mine are sisters. How about you? She was my high school classmate. I never knew anything about her personal life, so we were kind of surprised when she sent us the invitation. As always, she's very private. I see. Well, she's really like that ever since we were kids. She's always been a very quiet person. Okay? And that's situation number one. You're going to compare later situation number one and situation number two. Let's continue. So for situation number two, right, we have, okay, it says here, excuse me, would you know how to get to the nearest mall? Yes, in fact, you may go there on food or simply take a jeepney. If you walk, it will take you about 20 minutes to get there. You can just take the exit gate near the hospital. Then turn left and walk straight ahead. You won't miss it because of the big sign. Jeepneys take the same route. It should not take you more than 10 minutes, even with the traffic. And Speaker A said, thank you very much. I think I will just take the public transportation as I am running out of time. You have been really helpful. Thanks again. Now, I have given you two situations. Which do you think is transactional and which do you think is um, to maintain social relationship? Well, if your answer is situation number one for to maintain social relationship, then you are correct, okay? As you can see, they are getting to know more of each other. They want to get to know the, the other person in terms of their relationship to the bride, right? Now, what about in situation number two? Situation number two is just more of asking information, how to get to the nearest mall. So this one is what we call as transactional. We are communicating because we want to get information from other person whom we are talking to. Okay, I hope it's clear now. Let's move on to our next part, and that's going to be extended communication. So it involves the use of electronic media. And when we talk about extended communication, unlike before, when it only called for the use of television and radio, nowadays the description of extended communication may be expanded as to include tele, audio, phone conferencing, video conferencing, Skype, Zoom, and other technological means. To make it short, when we say extended communication, it's a communication that is being channeled through different media platforms so right now we are acquainted with that especially now that we are on temporary lockdowns for example we are communicate even until now right we are communicating we're using extended communication actually because we're using an app just to convey i'm using an app for example just to convey my information to you guys so that's an example of extended communication so again we have let's review we have intrapersonal communication, we have interpersonal communication, and we have extended communication. So from the first one, again, when you say intrapersonal communication, you're reflecting within yourself. That's a communication. Let's say, for example, you're, it's a battle between your mind and your heart, right? So you're kind of reflecting on the best thing that you should do in a given situation. That's intrapersonal communication. Next, we have interpersonal communication. You're communicating with other people. Okay, it can be your objective can be transactional or to maintain social relationship. And the last one is extended communication. You are using other media platforms to convey your uh, thoughts, your opinions or your feelings. Okay, next, moving on to different communication models. So we have Aristotle's model. We have Laswell's model, Shannon Weaver's model, and David Burlow's model. We'll get to know more about them later. But I guess you're all familiar with them when you were in a senior high school. So they were already discussed by your teacher. But this time, let's just have a quick recap of everything. 
Okay, so let's go with uh, Aristotle's communication model. Well, we all know that he is the one of the greatest philosopher. Until now, he's a really in a legend in terms of philosophy. Okay, so what is Aristotle's communication model? This is a very first communication model. Is what you can see here. There are three variables involved in the communication process. There's a speaker, the speech, and audience. Now I'll ask you, what do you think is the most important variable in the communication process in his model? Is it speaker? Is it speech? Is it audience? Well, your answer is speech, no. Okay, definitely not speech, not audience. So the correct answer is the correct answer is speaker. So according to Aristotle, the very important, the most important variable in the communication process is the speaker. Okay, so that's it. Why? Why? Say, for example, there is a politician, right? And uh, this politician is invited to speak to, um, to, his, to his possible possible constituents someday so he's talking with the aim of convincing the voters to vote for him in the coming election right so for example the name of the the politician is peter so peter will talk about um the needs of that community where those people are are living at okay so he will be talking about the needs that if ever he he will be voted he will do this and do that blah 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 something like that so again it's his aim is to convince them to vote for him so as a speaker he needs to do everything in order to get his message across successfully so he will use good tone of voice he need to make sure that he is having maintaining an eye contact he's using an appropriate facial expression to convince his listeners to vote for him in the coming election so in that case it's a one-way communication in there the speaker is the one who is being active but the audience are just pure listeners and active i don't know passive listeners okay um if we're delivering speech, this is usually what we're using, especially for having persuasive speeches. We're in the audience. We're not sometimes given the feedback. Audience will just listen to you passively. And your goal is to convince them to believe in your cause. Okay, so that's an example of the Aristotle's communication model. Until now, we're still using that model, of course, unconsciously. Okay, next we do have uh, Laswell's communication model. He is just emphasizing the who said it, what, what was said, in which channel was it said, to whom was it given, and what was the effect. Actually, uh, Laswell's communication model uh, existed because at this time he was just studying, uh, you know, the the impact or the effect of communication to to business side, especially in terms of promoting a product, for example. So usually, um, people. Uh, they it's, it matters a lot who said that thing regarding a product that's why business people are trying to get famous personalities to to promote their product because you know buyers we buyers sometimes listen to those who are credible enough to say it say for example the the product is about whitening right it's a whitening product of course you will not get someone who is black, right? Because it's whitening product. So you would obviously get some a Korean model, for example, or Filipino model who's very white in complexion. And it appears that he's saying, oh, you know, by using this product, it becomes super white, diamond white, golden white, something like that. And which channel was it used? So um, 
it will be broadcasted on TV or on YouTube or on other media platforms. To whom? So you have to take note who is the receiver. If it would be more on women, then you have to get a person, of course, who is also a woman. And what was the effect of that? They are studying what's the effect of all of these if they were able to garner a lot of customers. So that was the reason why Last Will's communication model existed. Okay. All right. So moving on. It was described by Harold White Laswell back in 1948. Okay, next we have Shannon and Weaver's communication model. So at that time, uh, Laswell was working for Bell Laboratories in 1949, and Claude Elwood, Shannon, and Warren Weaver's model of communication was introduced. Uh, at first, it was conceptualized for the functioning of the radio and television servings, serving as a model for technical communication and later on adapted in the field of communication. So here is an example. So there's this, this sender, right? You see this, who is being the source of the information. And then the message will be encoded, okay? So whatever things that we have in mind, it will be encoded, right? will be verbalized and of course there would be like a signal and there's a channel channel how did you how did you uh what channel what communication did you use to get your message to your target recipients and then there's decoding of course the recipient will decode it will try to understand what what is being said and of course, the message will be delivered. But along the way, this model emphasized that there is some noise or what we call as distractions. Sometimes there is a possibility that while you are trying to get your message across the recipient, there are some noise distractions that your message will not be transmitted 100%. Okay, that's why, for example, if teacher is talking right now, and you're listening to me, and at the same time you're chatting with your friends, there's a possibility that you miss out my message. You know what I'm saying? And that part where you're chatting with your classmates, that's an example of noise, okay? Unfortunately, this model lacks feedback, right? So the very first model of this one lacks feedback, but otherwise it's actually very nice. This model is really good. Okay, but it's just that it doesn't have feedback. Okay, all right, let's continue, dear. Moving on. Yeah, so that's it. How, how different is it from the first two models discussed earlier? Well, I think, well, of course, there is the addition of noise or distraction, which is very true. Along the way, we, could, we really could not um, transmit the message most of the time, 100%, because along the way, there is distraction. Okay. All right. Sometimes distraction can happen externally, sometimes internally. Like we are all, you can't, seems that you're listening to me, but inside you're thinking about something, right? So this still considered to be the noise. Okay, next we have Brillo's communication model. So this was David Brillo. He conceptualized it in 1960 and probably the most well-known among the communication models. It's initially called SMCR. S stands for sender, message, communication, or channel rather, sorry, and of course, receiver, okay? And it was later modified to include noise, okay? SMCRN. Okay, so what about this one? So we have here the source which is the person who has that information. For example, if that information can, comes from your mind, so that you become the source. So when we talk about source, that includes the person's attitude, the person's culture, what he or she believes in, her communication skills, his knowledge, his social system. Okay, and of course, for message, it includes the content, elements, treatment, structure, and code. Okay, later I'm gonna later on I'm gonna illustrate that. So for channel we have 
how did you transmit your message? How did you get your message to your receiver? Is it by hearing? Is it by seeing? Is it by touching, smelling, tasting? And of course, for the receiver, you know, um, there's a possibility that a person can get the message 100%, okay, if they have the same communication skills, attitudes, knowledge, social system, culture. You know what I'm saying? Why? For example, I will be I will be telling you about my personal belief on a uh, topic about environmental change, right? So that's the information is coming from me. I am the source. And my message is we are we need to help each other in order to to save, somehow save our environment. What did I use? What channel did I use? Some, well, maybe I would use, like, I really personally say that to you, then that involves hearing, seeing me, right? Not tasting me, of course. Okay, so only two channels, hearing and seeing. And then you as a receiver, it would make sense to you more if you have the same attitude with me. If you're more an environmentalist, therefore, my message will get to you or will be delivered to you 100% because you also have, you can relate to it. You have the same knowledge. You have the same beliefs. Okay? So that's the importance of SMCR. There are times we're in, you're not on the same page. You know what I'm saying? The source and the receiver are not on the same page. They don't have the same values, systems, or the way the way they think that they're different. Then sometimes the message will not be transmitted 100%. Okay? So that's why sometimes we need to... Um, Think about who will be our audience or our listeners. Okay, so that's it. Moving on. Okay, so I guess we're done. Again, let's have a quick review. So for our communication models, we have Aristotle's model. We have Laswell's model, Shannon Weaver's model, David Burla's model. And we have general principles of effective communication. I guess this is the very the the meat of the matter. Because we want to improve our communication and we want to be an effective communicator, an effective speaker. By doing so, we can send our message, our thoughts to people effectively. Now, the first one is know your purpose in communicating. It's very important for us to know our purpose in communicating because if you don't know your purpose, you can't get your message across, you know? Uh, so you need to know, um, am I going to communicate to inform, to persuade, to entertain? Now, you get to know things about that. You need to know about that. Okay, next, know your audience. Are my audience kids, teenagers, adults, professionals? By, do, by knowing your audience, you would be able to improve your speech, your communication. For example, you will be delivering a talk to, or you'll be delivering, uh, you'll be telling a story rather to a group of elementary kids of course knowing the fact that they are elementary students they want to they want to have animated facial expressions they want to have a good tone of voice that would characterize the characters in the story very well okay so you have to know your audience okay that's the key next know your topic there's a saying that you cannot give what you do not have, and that is true. You cannot talk about something which you really do not know anything about, or else you will just be saying nonsense all throughout your speech, all throughout your communication. Okay, next we have adjust your speech or writing to the context of the situation. Now, for example, you'll be delivering a talk to 
the graduates. Of course, you have to adjust your speech in a way that could inspire graduates to move forward, to do their best after graduation. Another thing is, if you're talking, for example, you have to adjust your, your speech when you think that your audience are not, are not listening already. So, for example, if you think that they are already yawning or they are restless, that gives you a clue that your speech now is very boring. Maybe you can crack a joke in between. Okay? So, that's it. That's how you adjust your speech according to the context of the situation. Next, work on the feedback given to you. It's a very important, this one. We are not perfect. From time to time, we have to master something. We need to improve something. So you can't say that, oh, I've been a speaker for, for a decade now. And who, who is she to say something against me about how I deliver my speech? Well, you know, if you always create a room for improvement, you would definitely improve. But if you are, you know, blocking yourself with all the feedbacks that should that are given to you, you will definitely will not improve, my dear. Okay, so you have to work on it. Treat the feedback that was given to you in a positive way. Because at the end of the day, it will help you improve as a speaker, as a communicator. Okay. All right. Next, principles of effective oral communication. First one, like I said, you have to be clear with your purpose. This is oral communication now. Complete with the message you deliver. You should not be running around the bush. You have to get your message across successfully. You have to be concise. Okay. Okay. Direct to the point. Be natural with your delivery. Be you, okay? Do not follow other people. Be you. Be natural, okay? All right. Be specific and timely with your feedback. So this is very important, especially if you have friends and they're having oral communication. It's also nice to help your friends with giving timely feedback. You can start off by saying, you know what? You did good in this aspect. You did good on this part blah 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 right and then after that you can say something like but i guess next time you could do better if you do this blah 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 right so something like that next principles this time of effective written communication you have to be clear like in oral communication being clear what what you're talking is very important be concise as i mentioned be concrete be correct with what you're writing okay especially if you are writing technical technical stuff okay you have to be correct for example if you're writing a memo okay you have to be correct in that case or else you will be labeled as someone who is saying something that is not true you be coherent okay meaning your your writing an essay for example your introduction your body and conclusion should be stitched together they should be organized in a way that they connect with each other <clears throat> excuse me be complete as well and be courteous okay i'd like to emphasize this Courtesy in communication is not only for oral. You can show your courtesy even in written communication. For example, if you're writing a letter, most of us will just say, for example, you're addressing it to me, you would say like, Dear Mrs. Billionis, comma. Technically, that is not being gorgeous. Why? Because you are sending that letter to someone who is in authority, in this case, to, some, to your teacher. So court, you can show courtesy by writing a colon. Okay, that's being gorgeous. Because comma is only used for friendly letters. Like letters that you are going to send to your friends, to your family, to your loved ones, but if you're going to send it to someone who is in authority, you have to use column, okay? 
what else you have to be you can show courtesy or being courteous if you read if you cite the correct title of that person so for example you're writing a letter still you have if that person that you're writing to is a doctor you have to indicate their title their designation and stuff like that and one thing the greatest mistake spelling do not you you are showing that you're courteous to that person if you should spell his or her name correctly so those are just examples on how you can show courtesy when you're writing okay all right so let's move on to our next part ethics of communication so it's very important that when we're communicating we have to establish an effective value system okay that would uh, pay for the development of your integrity as a person for example if you communicate in a way that you're always you're always cracking a joke even with outside the context right you're not having or you're not developing your integrity there okay if you are cursing other people while you're communicating you're not developing your integrity there so that's one ethic that we have to um, bear in mind Next, we have to provide complete and accurate information. It's very important. We should not spread fake news, especially at this moment. During this pandemic, when people are going online, please avoid spreading fake news. Okay, the online world is already flooded with that. Don't add to that, okay? And number three, disclose vital information adequately and appropriately. It's very important that we do that appropriately, okay? So if it's something that is private, we should not divulge that information to other people, okay? Especially now, especially that you will soon become professionals. You should really value this ethics of communication. Okay, so we're on, we're already done with our lesson. So this time we're going to check your understanding. So um, I'll be sending to you the link through the group chat. And this will serve as your progress check class. You have to view the speech of a politician and answer the following questions. You have three questions over there. Do you think the five principles of effective oral communication were followed? Which ones were followed? Which ones were not? Why or why not? Number three, if you were the speaker, how would you improve this kind of speech? And you can access that speech through this link, right? You can take a picture of that. Okay, so my references are the following. Okay, so before we end our uh, weekly lesson, let me have this quotation. Good communication is the br bridge between confusion and clarity. That is true. Okay, so I think I have covered everything for this week. So thank you so much and I'll see you again next week.